What's up, everybody? It's Make It Make Sense. And you guys wanted to, you wanted me to read this Hiding in Hip Hop book. I've now finished the book. It is definitely a lot of things that I did not necessarily um, expect. <laughs> we'll say um, it's it's been interesting to say the very least. If you guys got to read this book initially with me, go ahead and put in the comment section. We didn't read full chapters. We just kind of like clipped a few things out. But um, even in just those clips, I was very, what do they say? You What do they say? You clutch your pearls? <laughs> it was like, I don't know why he wrote this book. I want to kind of give you a preface for why I'm reading it. We started this because of the Diddy stuff, and I was told I needed to get this book. So I got it. I'm also working on the Erica Kennedy book, and um, we're just going to see where this takes us. I'm. You will be able to kind of ascertain what's going on in this book <laughs> solely based on descriptions, where they worked, who they knew. But I'm going to let you guys do it. That's part of the... I don't know why he wrote this book. He did say that he was a, you know, he was, we'll just say addicted to, you know, the the boom boom with the coom coom and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> we're going to get right into it. We're going to read some pretty juicy chapters. We're going to be going through chapters 14 through 17. <sighs> And you can, you guys will kind of be able to tell me if you want me to do the whole thing on this actual channel. But without further ado, like the video as the intro plays, because we got a lot to get into. Make it make sense. Could somebody please make it make sense? Person I follow, um, what is it called? Um, make it make sense. There's a little guy, make, make it make, make sense. sense. Are you being nice For tonight? A great media outlet, make that make sense. Okay. Um, shout out to Mr. Make It Make Sense. Make it make sense. You know what was up. Big Moose! Surfer. Make it make sense. Tell me how you squeeze it. Make it make sense. Tell me about the things that you say. Make it make sense. Tell me about the things in your dreams. Hey, let me work out all the things in between. Make it make sense. Tell me how you squeeze it. Make it make sense. At this present time? Who are you talking to? To you, Whitney. Ask me no questions like I'm a child. Y'all want to know what I'm doing all the time. I don't give a shit about what you're doing all the time. You are so nosy, man. You don't even know what I do. Like you said, you never met me. You don't know me. You ain't been in my house. You don't live with me. You don't sleep with me. You don't do shit with me, but talk about me. So watch what you say. Watch what the you <laughs> Watch what the you say. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> chapter 14, Hiding in Hip Hop. Dirt off your shoulder. Everything was going great in my life. I had a job, my own place, a relationship, and I was far away from my family. They couldn't get to me. I chose not to reach out to them. I had decided they didn't deserve to be part of my world since they had left me hanging at critical times in my life. It was nearing Christmas, and our entire department was called into the office of the president of Orient Pictures. We had all filed into this huge office overlooking Century City Mall. The president applauded us for all our hard work as a dedicated team and then said, Orion Pictures has been bought and it will no longer exist. You will be receiving severance pay at the end of the week. This Friday will be everyone's last day in the office. We all looked around at one another in shock. No one said a word. He thanked us again for all our hard work and told us to be excited about the future. He pulled out a putter from his golf bag, stood up and pretended to be swinging at a golf ball and said, I'm going to get some relaxation and go see my daughter this weekend. We all walked out of his office in disbelief. Was this really happening, I wonder? I'm getting severance pay and I just got hired two months ago. This is truly a blessing. Sad as it sounds, I was thinking about the money. I couldn't have cared less about the job because I felt I could always get another one. That Friday, I picked up my regular paycheck and severance check for $7,500. I was ecstatic. 
The first thing I was going to do was buy a car, which I needed badly. I was through with riding the bus. I also needed to find another job, but I had enough money to hold me over for a few months. Um, if you're just coming in, definitely hit that like button. We have almost 400 people in the chat. I took the bus to a car dealership in Burbank and drove off the lot with a 1995 white two-seater Honda CRX. I had always wanted a two-seater car since I was a little boy because they seemed sporty and flashy and rich. And this car was sharp and fast. Who is he talking about? Right now, he's just giving you background. But who will he be talking about? A lot of people. Actors, models, female rappers. Female rappers who allegedly abuse their girlfriends. It's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. A few days later, I got calls about possible jobs from Jimmy, a guy I had met through my boy Jacob and Alexis, who lived with Sandy's who lived at Sandy's apartment. Alexis was attending an entertainment conference in Washington and said she would take my resume to hand out. Jimmy was a native Californian and an aspiring singer. Talk about a brother with some pipes. Jimmy had a smooth and silky old school sound like that of Donny Hathaway. He worked at Motown Records and he let me know there was a position available as the assistant to Suzanne DePasse. I jumped on both opportunities. Alexis took my resume with her to the entertainment conference, and Jimmy hooked me up with an interview at Motown Records. I went to the interview to meet with this legendary Suzanne, Suzanne DePasse, the woman who had discovered the Jackson 5. I was thrilled. Miss DePasse was just as beautiful in person as she was on television. She was professional and direct in describing me to the qualifications she needed an assistant. Near the end of the interview, Miss DePasse said to me, Terrence, I have no doubt you will be very successful. You are a very bright young man, and even though I didn't get the job, her words left me feeling invincible. Ms. DePasse's office did refer me to Benny Medina. Now, y'all know who Benny Medina is. Benny Medina is the man behind Will Smith. He's the man behind J-Lo. He's the reason that J-Lo... Oh, DePas. Okay. Thank you, the J effect. <sighs> y'all know I will butcher a name. You just got to tell me how to say it. So it's DePas. <clears throat> So Benny Medina is the reason that J-Lo was able to take them vocals from Ashanti and, and make it sound like they were her own. Y'all remember, she was getting her songs and she was keeping her vocals as the lead vocals. And um, <laughs> y'all remember, anyway. She left me feeling invincible. Miss DePas did refer me to Benny Medina, Benny Medina of Handprint Entertainment. Benny was looking for an additional assistant in his offices. On the day of my interview, I ran into Cortez, a well-known actor that I had met in New York, whose sister was a good friend of mine. I had known him since he was a teen. He had his own television sitcom for a short while. And as an adult, he did a few other sitcoms for network television. He found success when he started producing television project projects. So I don't know who that was. Initially, I thought it was that dude from the Steve Harvey show that passed away. Um, with a name like Cortez, you can put in his, I can't remember his name from the Steve Harvey show, but he had done a few sitcoms. Hey, Terrence, man, it's good seeing you. What are you doing here? He asked as we embraced. It's good seeing you too. I live out here now. Having him that close brought back memories. Running into each other was quite a surprise for both of us. Cortez just looked Romeo. Now, he's he does not... Mer okay, Romeo, that's the guy. But he's not saying that Cortez was one of his whenever, just people he knew from the industry. Um, Cortez looked just as good as I remembered. He still had a boyish grin and the most beautiful dark eyes. We had spent a lot of time together when he was in New York, and being around him always made me feel flustered. His laugh and his touch were all that I needed to feel good. I met Cortez when I was new to the game, and to me, he was a seasoned veteran. He'd been on television, lived in Los Angeles, and hung with other celebrities. He was very low-key, and being a celebrity didn't go to his head. That is the thing that I really liked about him. When I was around Cortez and his friends hanging in their world, he never put on any fronts. I couldn't have asked for anything else. What's up, Gabor? The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is based off Benny Medina's life. You're talking about Merlin Santana. No. So for this particular book, there's a lot of chapters. So I'm going to kind of like skip around if you guys really want me to read the whole thing. Um, the first, I don't know, maybe 
10 chapters are his background. So if you want, if I end up reading the whole thing, you can just go chapter by chapter and they will be in order. But for now, I'm reading some of the chapters where he's an adult. But if you have questions, just let me know. Um, and thanks for the super chat, Gabor. We got um, almost 600 people in the chat. Definitely hit the like button. It's a free way to support the channel, and it lets YouTube know we're here. This isn't my normal content. Who is the author? His name is Terrence Dean. He worked his way up to being like a producer in MTV, and he had a he was a he was a how do I say it? He was an addict that liked to. And it was men, women, and everything in between. Not everything in between, but you know what I mean. Anyway. <clears throat> so what are you doing here, I asked. Benny and I are discussing him possibly managing me. I'm working on a new comedy show and we're working out the kinks. What are you doing here? He repeated with a big grin on his face. I have an interview with Benny. Word. Hold up. I'll be right back. Cortez went into Benny's office. A few minutes later, he came out and told me that he spoke with Benny and told him to strongly consider me for the position. After a short meeting with Benny, I knew we wouldn't work well together. I wonder what Benny said in there. Because he was dramatic, demanding, and over the top. His diva attitude was in full effect, and I didn't want to be in the line of fire. I couldn't get out of Benny's office quick enough. Now, remember, this dude didn't even have a job at this point. <laughs> and he's turning down a major studio, like to be an assistant for a major manager. I couldn't get out of Benny's office quick enough. It was too chaotic with people everywhere. The phones are ringing off the hook and the girl answering them looked flustered. I got a good glimpse of what my life would be working with Benny. Cortez was in the reception area when I came out and I thanked him for putting in a good word for me. How did it go? He asked. It went well. You know, I'm going to look out for you. When can we get up? I want to see you. Call me. It would be great to get back with you. I smiled as we exchanged information. We did have some unfinished business. Once I was out the door, I felt a sigh of relief. The irritability and anxiety I felt in Benny's office was gone. During the interview, it seemed like every two minutes he had to answer an important call or someone was knocking on the door, interrupting the flow of our conversation. But working with Benny could provide access to many contacts. This was the man who created Will Smith, Tyra Banks, and Jennifer Lopez's careers. Benny is the man in Hollywood. He's well-respected and well-known. Working with him would open many doors for me. I truly thought about how this could benefit my career. After working with him for a year or two, I could practically write my own ticket in Hollywood, but I also knew what I had to do. Immediately, I called the office when I got home. I wish to thank you for the interview and offer. Unfortunately, I will be unable to accept the position at this time. I don't think I would be a good fit for you. This is coming from a man who didn't even have a car. And yes, the author is gone. He is on my list. What's up, 2%? We got Gabor and 2% in the house. That <laughs> uh, 2% is one of my day ones. It's great seeing you. Homie, love a friend. Almost two weeks had gone by when I got called for an interview as a production coordinator for the Kenyan Ivory Wayland show. Alexis had given them my resume at a conference in Washington a few weeks back, and they wanted to meet with me immediately. Alexis really looked out for me. That was a true blessing. Let me tell you a little bit. Even in terms of like YouTube, y'all, it is really about who you know. Going to BravoCon, all of these people knew each other. I'm talking about like the creators. All these people had like their own podcast and things like that. And they all knew each other and they did not know your boy. Luckily, straight shooters were in the house. We got to talk. We got to hang out. Every time I saw a straight shooter, you can always get a drink from me. But um, this is the same way. It's word of mouth. They didn't have LinkedIn back then. What they had was, I know somebody who was good and that's all it took. So your boy is having to work on that. I'm I'm starting from the bottom. Um. But a different kind of bottom than Mr. Terrence Dean. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. After a few interviews, I landed the job as a production coordinator of an on-air promos for the Keenan Ivory Wayne-in show. Buena Vista Television, a division of Disney, was producing the show. I was going to be working directly with Keenan to produce promo spots for various markets in the United States. I love the whole Keenan. I, I love the whole Wayne's family. 
Marlon, Sean, hilarious. Brides, um, White Chicks, one of my favorite movies. In Living Color, I know those skits like from the back of my hand. And my favorite is The Sister. Kim is absolutely hilarious. I don't know why she did not continue on. I know the family is like a billion dollar family, you know, through their movies and stuff, but I absolutely love the Wayne and family. Keenan's hit television show and Living Color had catapulted him as a comedic genius. He also made several movies that were box office hits. Keenan and his family had become a viable entity in Hollywood. While working on the show, I got to meet his brother, Sean, Marlon, Damon, and his sister, Kim, who came to the set regularly. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. He's not about to say anything about Sean. Stop it. I'm reading your mind. Stop it. <laughs> uh, Heather, Heather Stanley, thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate you. Remember, we got over 700 in the chat. Definitely hit that like button. Um, yes, Terrence died under interesting circumstances. Nobody actually knew anything about him being sick. I, but I am working on that death toll video. And again, Terrence is on it. I learned a lot by being in Keenan's presence and listening to him. He was direct, professional, and he knew his shit. Keenan didn't take any mess from anyone, and he knew how much he could get away with. He knew how to play the game. The Disney executives were all older white men and women. It seemed like they were intimidated or afraid to approach him most of the time. Keenan often joked that they would send me the send me the black guy to get him to read the promos because they figured he and I had more of a connection. It worked, and I noticed how Keenan often treated them when they came on set. He let them know he was in charge, and if they were banking on him to have a successful show, they better let him do what he knew how to do best, his comedy. But the executives needed Keenan to cooperate because his show was new and it was hard to book guests to appear on it. They pleaded with Keenan to ask his celebrity friends to make appearances, which would make the job of the talent bookers easier. However, most of Keenan's friends were other black celebrities, and the talent bookers often had no idea who they were. I came to learn it was important for blacks working in the business to acquaint themselves with both black and white actors and actresses. The whites working in the business often didn't concern themselves with many black actors. It was obvious whenever the talent bookers posted their weekly and monthly bookings on the show board, it was often filled with white actors who I, along with quite a few crew members, didn't realize, I'm sorry, didn't recognize. It was my job to research them, to call the studios and get promotional clips. It was from those clips that I learned about an actor. Then I would have to sit with the editor doing the promos and point out the actor we were using for the ad. Um, Nitwit, I like your I like your name. Happy Friday, Mims. When is the Houston meetup? I don't know. I don't know. I probably should have done a meetup um during the uh when when Funky Dineva when I met Funky Dineva and Claudia Jordan and Al. Thank you for the super chat. Two percent. I appreciate the content. Thank you for always the shadiest yet fairest content. Now I'm a run from this from the beginning. Ready for your 100K celebration. Thank you guys. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe. We definitely are on the road to 100,000, which is absolutely insane. Thank you, 2%. Miss Kiki, thank you for being a member for 13 months. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh -uh. Homie, okay, I'm sorry. Whenever black actors were pitched for bookings, it always it was always like pulling teeth to get the talent bookers to understand who some of the most prominent black actors were. Although some were big among the black audience, it's all about numbers and ratings and who's watching and tuning into the show. It's about advertisers and dollars. If an advertiser can't see a return on their investment, they pull their ads. Disney was concerned with Keenan's appeal to a broader audience. They wanted him to translate to white people in middle America. His show needed to do well in areas like Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. It became important to book white actors on the show for middle America because they wanted to see people like them. On another note, y'all, I told you that I have been in talks with some with celebrities and people close to the Diddy situation. So they have seen us, they have seen these chats, and they're taking notice. I am currently working on an interview with somebody who is very connected to the situation. So that whole shady but fair and doing this with integrity and not just making up stories, it's, you know, people are seeing us 
And I say us because this is us. We are the straight shooters. So the channel is, we got a lot going on. Oftentimes, we had to tone down Keenan's sketches in the edit room because most of the scenes were ethnically offensive and humor. Keenan needed to appear as a friendly, warm, and inviting host. The over-the-top antics he's known for had to be heavily edited so as not to offend certain viewers. While working for Keenan, I forged a relationship with a freelance producer from the same studio lot working on another show. Edwin was a natural-born hustler. He had an impeccable work ethic and was on top of his... I was thoroughly impressed by his style. Edwin was mature for a 20-year-old. <clears throat> I had to remind myself that he was still a kid. He had pure innocence about him, but he was a hot, hot mess. I learned that Edwin liked to dress in women's clothing and makeup. He was a transvestite. Now, this was in the 90s, y'all, so I don't think it's the correct terminology anymore. I, I think cross-dresser, but forgive him if he... Um, Forgive him if we if he says some things that aren't acceptable today. <clears throat> Although he liked to dress as a woman, he had no desire to be one. Edwin taught me a lot about his world. He educated me on down low men who liked men who dressed as women. These brothers enjoyed the illusion that they were sleeping with a woman, yet had the equipment of a man. It was a world I had never known existed. Edwin informed me that many actors and rappers solicited transvestites, especially those who were not easily recognizable as men in dresses. The prettier you were, the more likely you were to date a celebrity, and Edwin was pretty. He had golden brown skin with oval eyes due to his Caribbean, Spanish, and Asian background. What he taught me were lessons I would never forget and one that I refer to to this day. No matter how much you may think you know a person, you really don't know them at all. I also made a lot of friends on The Keenan Show. It was good to be working with so many young Black people who were producers, writers, and key decision makers. We hung out a lot together after work at restaurants to shoot the breeze and talk about the show. People often brought along their significant others, and we got to know one another well. I would bring Kathy to keep my cover. Kathy was his friend and his beard. That's what we would call her today. Although I was close to a few of the crew, I was still not comfortable in sharing my sexuality. I had witnessed how they treated an openly gay co-worker. Once he let everyone know he was gay, the jokes began behind closed doors. I didn't want to experience that type of ridicule. It's really hard to keep lying and remembering the lie you tell people. They want to know who you are dating, how long, where did you meet, and if she's the one. Although I had numerous girlfriends in college and a few afterward, I was a single man living in Los Angeles. In a city where beautiful women are everywhere, people will speculate and question why you're not dating. I, along with many of my download friends, had girlfriends or cover girls. Cover girls are close friends who don't mind being an arm candy when we need to date, when we need a date for company picnics, dinners, and parties. I had even been to parties and saw download men with their cover girls. Most times the women are aware of our sexuality and it helps us to keep our cover. She understands the turmoil we experience daily when we are bombarded with the questions, what did you do over the weekend, or how's your girlfriend? I hated going to work on Mondays because I knew the questions were coming. I knew people were not being nosy, but just wanted to be a part of my life. They were genuine asking me because they wanted to be friends with me, but I couldn't open myself up. It was hard to let them down. I'm sorry. It was hard to let down my guard and allow others into my world. It was filled with so much garbage that I didn't want people to discover the trash I was hoarding. Although I never told my cover girl, Kathy, about my sexual preference for men, I gather she figured it out. Now, y'all, this is strange to me. Even your closest friends, people who you are introducing as your girlfriend and she's being used as cover, you still don't feel comfortable enough exposing that to her because she is not in the gay world that is crazy to me that is absolutely crazy to me um she never questioned if i was dating or who i was sleeping with she knew i was probably uncomfortable talking about my sexuality and she went along with my need to stay secretive when Kathy and I were at parties, we danced seductively together. We took care of each other. We knew each other well, and seeing us interact, no one suspected a thing. We attended Kenan's birthday party. It was an open bar with food everywhere. A DJ was mixing the latest sounds, but the main event and center attraction of the party was a huge boxing ring in the middle of the floor. That night, 
we were treated to a boxing match between two women in bikinis. Um, okay, yeah, we got almost a thousand in the chat. Again, this is not my normal content. Nitwit, thank you for becoming a member of the Stray Shooters. I appreciate you. Hit that like button. It's the only way YouTube is going to know that we are here. People ask, why do I ask for likes? Likes are a way that YouTube considers um, people engaging with you. So it's a free way to support the channel. Any new content creators, definitely you can use that as well. Everyone gathered in front of the boxing ring to watch, but Kathy and I sat at the back. There were two male celebrity actors standing a few feet in front of us. They didn't notice us because the club was dark. Both men are young and very attractive and have starred in some comedic and dramatic films. One of the actors, Junior, is a tall, muscular, brown-skinned brother who got his start in television and is known for his comedic roles in films. He never married, but has a couple of children with a girlfriend. The other dark-skinned actor, Fritz, has been in a few movies and has starred in a popular television drama. Now, y'all, he uses fake names, so he uses fake names. As everyone cheered on the fighters, the two actors occasionally grabbed hands as they stood side by side. The taller actor, Junior, would squeeze Fritz's butt. Kathy and I looked at each other in shock. We couldn't believe that what we were witnessing. It was also confirmed for me what I and many others had thought about Junior. There had been speculation about his sexuality, but now I knew. I was completely surprised about Fritz, however. Throughout the night, I kept my eye on them. I wanted to make sure my eyes were not deceiving me. They stayed together all night long. They slyly touched hands, and Junior would gently place his hands on the back of his companion. Whenever a woman approached them, Junior and Fritz looked as if they were interested and entertained her with conversation. A few, after a few minutes, they would leave her at the bar as they searched out another spot to be alone. I followed them because I hoped that I, I'd see them engaging with another down-low man I didn't know about who was at the party. However, they just whispered in each other's ears and let our, I'm sorry, and let out hearty laughs. Watching them interact, I felt like Junior and Fritz were oblivious to their environment. And even though it was crowded and people were everywhere, no one but me paid attention to them. They were able to easily disappear in the crowd. By the end of the night, after sharing a few drinks, the two actors whisked away alone. I went home thinking about them. I wondered if they were a couple and serious about each other. I wonder if they were in any Hollywood down low circle I was not privy to. I was learning more and more about how deep and secretive the circles were in Hollywood. Charles and I were still hot and heavy. I was growing more fond of him, spending a lot of time at his house. One day, Charles bought a new car, a Volkswagen Jetta, and we rode around town. I had an urge to ask him about the women he had been sleeping with. Are you still sleeping with women? I asked nervously. I didn't want to know the answer, but I needed to know. There was a long pause. Yeah, I'm still sleeping with one of them. My heart sank. I'm also planning to ask my ex to marry me. I'm ready to settle down. I felt a knot in my stomach and my head was swirling. This wasn't happening. How did I not see this coming? Was I that blind or did I just ignore it? I just stared straight ahead. I didn't want to believe it. I had been played. Hell, he was playing all of us. I couldn't believe I had been such a fool. For the first time in a long time, I felt like I mattered to someone. Now, what's interesting about him is he does not date married men. However, he will sleep with the man who has a girlfriend because he feels like they aren't connected by God. So he's basically Evan Lozado. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I know y'all basketball wise fans are going to get me. I just start I just stared straight ahead. I didn't want to believe it. I can't sleep with you anymore, man. Just drop me off at home. Terrence, I'm sorry. I really do like you. It's not like I'm sleeping with any other men. I'm sleeping with a woman. It's not the same. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He really thought it didn't matter because they there were women and not men. Now, here's one thing. We now know that, now this is just my opinion, but the down low man 
who had maintained relationships with men and women, but who did not use, you know, rubbers is the reason that in the 90s and 2000s, Black women were the fastest growing group to get HIV. So, you know, some of the things I, as I'm reading, although I can understand that if he had come out, it would have, excuse me, potentially destroyed his career. When we're listening to Trist after Trist after Trist, I can't help but thinking I really hope that condoms were being worn. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He really thought that it didn't matter because they were women and not men. You know I love both D and P. I got to have them both. At least you know who I'm sleeping with. For the first time since we started the conversation, I turned and looked at him. Yeah, but you're talking about marriage. Did you tell her about me? Silence. I knew he had not told her because she had encouraged him to hang out with me. Now that is some shady stuff. You are sleeping with this woman's boyfriend. You came after. So it's not like he met her and then introduced. You came after. You are smiling and grinning in this woman's face, knowing that you are sleeping with her boyfriend. It's a lot. It's a lot. I can't pe be a part of this love triangle. You mean anymore? It's not fair to us. So now you're thinking that if only if there are three people in a relationship and only two people know the ins and outs, that woman is the one that is getting the short end of this stick in every way. Unless she was getting it into. Now, if she was getting it into, who knows? Because it looked like everybody in Hollywood was doing something. I just saw the tape with Tupac, Suge, and a whole bunch of women all in the same room. That's a lot. We got over 1,100 in the chat. Definitely hit the like button. If, if everybody is a consenting adult, then go for it. If everybody knows, but, you know, I can't call you. I, I don't know what to make of this because... He stayed private for so long, but he is very, very willing to kind of like give hints to who these people are. Work ain't honest, but it pays the bills. Work ain't honest, but it pays the bills, y'all. He can't even be trusted, but it is interesting listening to what he has to say. Uh, if you are new to the channel, definitely subscribe. We are on the road to 100K. Let me get. Okay. <clears throat> Come on, Terrence. I'm really sorry. We can work this out. You don't have to be so irrational about this. Charles said as he pulled in front of my apartment building, just give me another chance. In my rationality, I think I'm making the best choice. Go get married, Charles. As I walked up to my front door, he came up from behind me and made several attempts to come into my apartment. You know how hard our lifestyle is. I really do want to be with you. But you know we can't be together like you want. Do you know what I want? You want a relationship. But isn't that what I'm giving you? Don't you like what we have? Ain't that some hint? <laughs> you are telling this man that you're about to get married to this woman. But I'm going to keep you as basically just my booty call. You really don't get it. I have real feelings for you, and you're not sure what you want. I do know what I want. You know we can't be together in the way you want, Charles. The world is not ready for men like us. We have to be discreet. We can't be open about ourselves. I don't want people in my business. I don't understand why I can't have you both. I can't help that I love P. I can't help that I still have feelings for women, don't you? Yeah, I do. But I'm not leading people on. I'm not playing with other people's emotions. Now, he lied because at this point, he wasn't sleeping with no women. He was sleeping with a hell of a lot of men. Let's just go inside and talk about this. He smiled at me seductively. I knew this game. I had played it with him before. He figured was the best way to resolve the argument. I really care about you, but you can't come in, I said, stepping inside my apartment. You coming in here will only lead to just go home. I'm for real. I'm not joking. When I closed the door, every part of my body was screaming. What the hell are you thinking? Do you really want to give this up? Even though I wanted him to leave, a part of me hoped he would knock on the door. 
if he pleaded a little more, I would have left him. I would have let him in and we could have talked about it. But Charles walked away. So you were playing cat and mouse. This was basically the Brandy Monica song, The Boy Is Mine, and Monica won. Brandy's over there looking, hoping, back at the door. Okay, they're going to knock. He didn't knock. This man didn't knock because you were basically a booty call. You, he builds up these relationships in his mind. He is very in his head as it pertains to everything about his life. However, at this point, he's just like a production assistant. He's not like leading a department or anything, but he's still that scared that he only wants to have relationships with men, but he's not realizing that just having, you know, the nookie is not a actual relationship. That's how he's built these things up in his head. <clears throat> I kept picking men who put me second to everything else in their life. Perhaps I didn't love myself enough to let myself be put first. I never thought of myself deserving anything because I didn't come from anything. Now, that is true. It was sweep season and I began to work longer hours at the Keenan show. After work, I hung out with my new down low posse with, of coworkers. There was a lot of drinking and socializing. I loved it because it allowed me to numb and forget everything else happening in my life. One morning, I was running late to the set because I'd overslept from partying the other night. I was rushing to get to work and traffic was heavy. I was at a light making a left turn on Highland and Wilshire when an F-150 truck crashed into me. I woke up to firefighters, policemen, and paramedics surrounding my car. I couldn't move. The ambulance rushed me to Cedar sinai Medical Center on Beverly Boulevard, where they kept poking and prodding every part of my body. I was in serious pain and thought something was definitely broken, bruised, or hanging by a limb. But the doctors found nothing broken or bruised. Miraculously, I didn't suffer any broken bones. They worked feverishly and took several x-rays to figure out what happened to my back and why I couldn't move, but found nothing. I was moved to my own hospital room and the doctors informed me they were going to run more tests to find out what the problem was. The news of the accident spread through the Keenan set and my coworkers started visiting, sending flowers, cards, and balloons. I felt loved. I didn't realize how much people cared about me. The outpouring of concern brought me to tears. I didn't realize how many people I'd gotten to know in Los Angeles. For so long... Oh, yeah, definitely hit the like button. For so long, I felt as if people didn't genuinely care about me. How could they? They didn't really know me. They didn't know my struggles or my family background. I had never opened up and told anyone because I figured they wouldn't be able to relate. No one, no one I knew had a mother who was a prostitute and a heroin addict. No one I was familiar with was raised by their grandparents. They all seemed perfectly happy with their perfectly happy families. They shared how often they spoke with their mothers and fathers. They had relationships, be it good or bad, with their siblings. I didn't have any of that. I couldn't just call up my mother and get advice. Most of the time, no one had heard from her or knew where she was. My siblings were much younger than I and lived with relatives. I had no relationship with them. So he really was his own entity, and he had all these close friendships. People did not know anything about him. It really had to be a life of kind of like sadness to be honest my friends didn't know the burden i carried about my sexuality how much i was conflicted and oftentimes wanted my life to end on most days i didn't want to wake up i wanted my life to be over it all started when i was taken advantage of by ramon i was confused about what happened to me and why i kept thinking of men every time i heard the pastor lambasting gays i wanted for my life to end then i wouldn't have to deal with my sexuality I wouldn't have to struggle and try to be what everyone thought I should be. I wanted to be normal like everyone else. I often thought about taking my own life, but I was too afraid to do it. I was frightened by what I heard from my pastor who talked about those who took their own lives. They didn't inherit the kingdom of God. They went straight to hell. So just putting himself or putting, putting ourselves in his shoes, he did grow up with a mom who was a prostitute. So that meant that he saw sex in a different way he was taken advantage of as a child again when that innocence is taken a lot of people become hypersexual then being in this world if he had come out he would no longer be invited to all these download parties and download events and then he was religious 
to some extent, and he was told he was going to go to hell. They didn't inherit the kingdom of God. They went straight to hell. I was already living in hell dealing with my sexuality. I didn't want to take my life and live in the misery for eternity. So I just prayed that one day I would just not wake up. Then I wouldn't have to worry about being straight like my friends. I wanted desperately to have what they had. I envied their lives. I wanted to be straight. I wanted normalcy, a steady girlfriend, and kids. Why couldn't my life be simple and easy? Why did I just have to carry this burden? It was odd that during my time in Los Angeles, I got to meet so many people and traveled in so many different circles, and yet so, of my, so few of my friends knew one another. I was so entrenched in keeping secrets that merely became invisible, invisible imaginary people. They were, in essence, like my family. I loved it that my download friends came by and the ones in New York sent cards and flowers. I was moved by all the sentiments, but I was also upset and angry. I asked Sandy to call my family. Grandma Pearl called me at the hospital immediately. She cried and told me she was praying that I have a speedy recovery and she was happy I was okay. I didn't hear from the rest of the family. I didn't even get a card from them. It made me sad because I thought at least my family would make an attempt to come and see about me, but they didn't. Now, this part is kind of selfish because we don't see him also reaching out to his family, nor do we see him reaching out to his siblings. Because his mom was a heroin addict, heroin addict they were displaced. So he's wanting something from his family, but he's not actually doing anything to reach out to them. It's like he wants and he has expectations that he doesn't fulfill for anybody else. Again, familiar relationships were skewed when your mom is a pro, you know, a, a, an addict and, you know, selling her body. All the people I've met and developed relationships with in Los Angeles filled the void where my family's love should have been. Even though I didn't share much of myself, my friends made me feel welcome in their homes. They invited me to their significant others, and I was a part of their lives. I, all I wanted was to be accepted, for someone to love me, to be liked. I wanted that from family. I wanted them to be proud of me. I desperately wanted my mother to hug me and tell me how much she loved me. I desperately wanted to have a relationship with her. As much as my friends reach out, I couldn't allow myself to get close to them. I knew the moment they discovered the truth about me, they would desert me. They wouldn't want to be my friend any longer and didn't want to, and I didn't want to risk that. After a week in the hospital, the doctor's only explanation for my back pain was that I probably tensed at the moment of impact. It caused a back spasm, which prevented me from moving. One of my friends, Jesse, came and took me home. I asked him to stop by the garage where my car was impounded to see what it looked like because everyone told me how lucky I was to have survived. Um, I think it's Panga Lanco SM. Thank you so much for the super chat. I am a super fan. Love your channel. Thank you. I definitely appreciate that and that support. When I saw what used to be my car, I couldn't speak. It looked like someone had taken the car in their hands and crushed it like a beer can. The entire passenger side was smashed in. If the guy driving the truck had been going any faster, I would not be alive. My insurance covered everything but I still needed a car. A coworker called and told me that he had an extra car and that if I could make the monthly payments, he would let me drive it. It was a new green Toyota to sell. Now, I'm old enough to remember that you could get two to sales for $8,000. I remember that. It might've been, I remember because I told my mom she needed to get one for my sister and her. It might've been 1993. And, uh, we were kind of still new to the city and I don't think my mom had a car yet. And so I just wanted her to get a car. And I was like, you could, you, I was super young, but I was thinking, I saw this commercial. You could get two Toyota to sales for $8,000. That means when my sister's taking me to school, she'd have a car. And that means that my mom would have a car. So we wouldn't have to walk to the grocery store. <laughs> oh, <laughs> can't believe I remember that. Uh, okay, the green Toyota to sell. Where is it? It seemed like no matter what obstacle, tragedy, or pitfall I faced, a blessing always occurred, which drew me closer to God and made me want to learn more about myself. It was important for me to discover now and discover and know that I was a child of God and deserved greatness. Yet sometimes it was hard to know what greatness is when you feel defeated and beat up all your life. For the next couple months, things seemed to be going smooth. Then in April, I arrived on the set and noticed people seemed different. There was no audience. There was no audience lined up for the taping of the show, and the crew was not buzzing around as they normally did when we were taping. 
the show had been canceled and that was it people had to pack their pack their things and leave the set everyone was disappointed there were no warnings or indication the show was in trouble this was my first introduction to the television business hollywood style um where is it Pete, shows get canned without any warning people show up for work one day and are out the next that's the nature of the beast but one of the download brothers set me up with a job handling production for warner brothers film message in a bottle now y'all this is where he drops some serious hints and i don't think i'm gonna have to say too much i don't think i'm gonna have to say too much and i okay i'm nervous i'm nervous the film was Message in a Bottle starring Kevin Costner, Paul Newman, and Rob, Robin Wright Penn. It was a month-long job, and it paid really well. The job was on a ranch owned by the studio and not on the lot, but it was cool because the parking pass they gave me allowed me access to the lot at any time, and I was able to visit some of the brothers when I was not too busy at the ranch. My job wasn't bad at all. I would go by the production office in the morning to pick up the scripts and take them to the ranch. I only needed to make sure the actors had their scripts and other necessities for the table reads. The readings generally lasted five hours a day. One of the demands on the table reads was that all of Paul Newman's Newman's own products had to be available for the cast to eat. Y'all, okay, so Paul Newman is known for his salad dressings and all that. He made sure that it was not only in his writer, but everybody else had to eat his stuff on the set. Each day I had to refresh and restock the refrigerator and table with Newman's own goods. The cast would generally arrive around nine in the morning and finish right after lunch. Once they were done, I would head to the lot and meet up with some of the download brothers who worked at the studio. Sandy was also on the lot. She was working on a new movie that had some major stars in it. The lead was Lucas, who was a mega star. No matter what film project he was attached to, it was bound to be a box office smash. In Hollywood, he is considered a golden boy and very bankable. However, there were already many rumors swirling about his sexuality, and even though he married, it was hard for him to shake those pesky gay rumors. You're not going to believe this, Sandy said when I called her. What's going on? Well, the crew is taking bets on Lucas. What type of bets? Since we've been filming, his boy Kareem comes by every day and they go into the trailer while we're shooting. So what, I said. No, Kareem comes by and they are up in the trailer doing their thing. The thing thing? Yes, the thing thing, she laughed. Kareem, a leading sitcom actor, is married to an actress. They both have appeared in movies, but Lucas is the breakout sensation. His boy Kareem, however, found success in television as a leading actor. The crew's bet was based on how often Lucas's boyfriend would show up and how long he would stay. It was like clockwork. Kareem arrived each day at the same time and went straight to the trailer for hours on end, but the bets grew larger. When I moved to Los Angeles and got into the download world, our circle was talking about the download circle Lucas and Kareem were in, and which I wanted to be a part of, but it was hard it was a hard nut to crack. They were superstars. But sometimes even superstars slip up. And I wonder why they were not more discreet. Working with crews constantly buzzing around the set who were looking and paying attention even when actors think they are not. I've worked on many sets where I had to deliver scripts or messages to actors' trailers. And many of those actors surely did not practice any decorum smoking, having, and just buck wild. Now, here's the thing. He was working on Message in a Bottle, which was shot by Warner Brothers between 97 and 98. Another film from Warner Brothers on that set that was being shot was Wild Wild West. So it's important for me to say this here. These things are all allegations. Let me put this banner up. So even though he gives you enough stuff to connect the dots, it's allegations and it's one man's word. So you believe what you want. I'm just, you know, reading the book, but it's it's his word, his perception. 
I would I would later meet Lucas on another project I was working on. He was smooth, charismatic, and charming. Everyone loved him. I know I did. I couldn't help but fall for him. He was warm. He had a warm smile, and he was a personable presence. Lucas didn't need to have his ego stroke, and he had no diva airs about him. He made everyone feel like they were special. He spoke to the entire crew, and his wife even brought us goodies to thank us for helping them with the show. They were a class act. But I knew the secret Lucas held. He and I were in the family of Download Brothers. One morning when I arrived for work at Warner Brothers, there was a brother in the production office. He was fine as hell, scrumptious with a muscular body that just wouldn't stop. I had seen men like him in magazines, and to see him close up made my heart flutter. He could have been a calendar model. Our eyes met instantly. It was as if we were both wondering, who the hell is this black boy and how did he get a job on this film? We each nodded, what's up? We couldn't talk because it was early in the morning and I needed to get to the ranch. I was hoping when I came back later in the afternoon, he would still be there. When I got to the ranch, I immediately called one of my boys at the studio to find out who this man was. My friend Eric said, oh, I see you met Marcus. He's fine, ain't he? Why didn't you tell me about him? I damn near tripped coming in the door when I saw him. I wanted you to see him for yourself. I didn't want to spoil the surprise. So what's up with him? Yeah, he's down and part of the family, but he already has a boyfriend. Damn, are they happy? I asked. Yeah, they're happy together. They've been together for two years. They don't hang out or socialize in many of the circles. I can hear, I can hear you over there thinking. We both laughed. I knew plenty of down low gay brothers like them. It wasn't uncommon or unheard of for a brother not to hang in the down low circles if they were too scared their secret would get out. Even though we all knew one another, we never disclosed any information about one another. We knew who to tell or who to trust. Now, in these down low circles, why would somebody with a boyfriend, a real boyfriend, be going to these parties? They were basically like hookups. You meet people, you hook up with them. This man actually has a boyfriend. So your libido is working overtime because he then told you he has a boyfriend and you want to know if they happy. I told you this was the Evelyn Lozada of, <laughs> of the down low world. So we knew who to tell or to trust with our information. We had our code and we stuck by it. You never out another brother. You defend him. But you've been doing it in your book, sir. When others are speaking about a brother and they ask if you know if he's gay, you deny, deny, deny it. On many occasions, I protected another brother's secret. Sure, I knew the truth, but I was not about to out him. I never revealed if anyone was part of the family. I would simply say, nah, I don't think he's gay. He's a cool brother, but he doesn't get down like that. I had been entrusted with the secret. Just before the actors were about to break for lunch, Marcus walked in the building. I was standing alone in the hall outside the conference room when he approached me with a bright, toothy smile. We did the general conversation about what we were doing in Los Angeles and what jobs we worked on and who we knew in the business. We talked for about an hour and a half before he realized that he had to get back to the production office. He asked for my contact information and we exchanged phone numbers. Marcus and I became fast friends while I worked on the film. After I finished the film, Marcus and I hung out more and more. He and I became like two peas in a pod. We had a lot in common. We both were the same zodiac sign, Virgos. We enjoyed reading self-help books on spirit spirituality and didn't mind being alone. We also were very private about our lives and did not divulge any unnecessary information. He would become one of my closest friends and someone I could always depend on. On many occasions, Marcus revealed to me how he didn't care what people thought of him. He was often approached by women because of his gorgeous looks. Nothing about him was effeminate or dainty. He loved cars and sports as well as Patti LaBelle and Whitney Houston. He was comfortable with his sexuality, but he didn't broadcast it. I really like that. I do like a um, a Patti LaBelle song. My mom used to play it all the time. Um, it was like, Somebody Loves You, Baby. I, was that her cleaning song? She, it was a song by Patti LaBelle, Somebody Loves You, Baby. I don't know what the name of it is. She used to play that in a song called The Wild Storm. I don't know. The night storm, wild storm, I don't know. Uh, that's it? Okay, so that is the name of it. Somebody Loves You. Yeah, she used to play it all the time. And and Wild Storm by, I think, Smokey Robinson? I don't know. 
Uh, he was comfortable with his sexuality, but he didn't broadcast it. Terrence, I don't give a F about these people. They are not paying my bills and we ain't effing. I wanted to develop that attitude. He was bold. I wanted to be bold, but I just couldn't get to that point. Maybe that's why I love being around him. He was what I desired to be. He was like a big brother to me. Quiet storm. Now, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's Boris. I've never, I never heard anything about Boris Cujo. Marcus invited me to various parties in Baldwin Hills. I met his boyfriend, Gary, for the first time and for the first time and other down low men, industry executives and businessmen. These parties were my entree into Los Angeles down low brothers with money. Most lived in mansions in Baldwin Hills and drove BMWs, Mercedes, Lexuses, and Range Rovers. They were wealthy, held positions in the community, and were involved in church. They seemed perfectly happy. I even dated one for a brief moment. I love being around Marcus and Gary. It gave me hope that two men could be in an emotional and intimate relationship. The way they cared about and supported one another was inspiring. They went to the gym together. They cooked their meals together and had date, excuse me, and had date night where they went out to dinner and the movies. They were affectionate toward each other, kissing and hugging, and Marcus would often playfully grab Gary from behind and nibble on his neck and ears. I love you, baby, he would say. Gary invited me to join them at his mother's home for Thanksgiving. His mother had a full spread of, on the table. The way Marcus and Gary interacted with everyone was so intimate. The family members completely comfortable with their relationship, and they all laughed, talked, and seemed to have fun. It made me long for a relationship like theirs. All of the down low men I met seemed jaded to the idea of being in a relationship. They felt like all men cheated. Now, sir, I got to call you out on this because you're dating down low men who are open with you about having girlfriends. Now, he says he draws the line at wives, but if they're cheating on their girlfriend to be with you, why would you think that they are going to leave their girlfriend or stop cheating to, to do something with you specifically? They were lying and cheating to the women they were with. They were deceptive in leading their women into believing that they were heterosexual men who were in love with them. Down low men know themselves better than anyone, and if they know they cannot be in a committed relationship with a the woman, then they sure as hell can't be committed in a relationship with a man. So you guys tell me, because these book readings, it's an hour worth of talking. It's not easy. Are you guys enjoying this? Because if so, I can definitely continue doing these book readings for you. Um, the book is not like super long. I read it in a day. There are a lot of more juicy, I guess, tidbits. Um, let's see. Okay, so you guys do want me to continue reading it. The reason I'm not going to read any more chapters today is because I'm still working on that Diddy death toll video. And y'all, it's up to a lot. I'm having records pull. What time period is this in? This is in the 90s to early 2000s. So right now, he's still in the 90s. It's a lot. And it's a lot of... There's one girl that I want you guys to hear about. It's a female rapper, but I couldn't figure out who they were talking about. But she had, you know, hits. There's a lot of male singers, people who are in groups. Diddy is mentioned quite a few times in this book, but he's mentioned by name. So, okay, so you guys do want me to continue reading this. Okay. The Diddy death toll count is way over 20 people. It just keeps growing. So that's why it's taking me so long to put together this list. And I'm not saying that Diddy took all these people out. I'm just saying people around him just don't seem to make it past 50 or into their 50s very long. So I'm going to keep going with it. Um, like the video. If you are new to the channel, please subscribe. We are definitely on our way to 100K subscribers. Um, we're actually very close to 87,000 right now. So thank you guys for being here. I will keep doing this. If I can finish that Diddy video, I'll do it tonight. But it's a lot. It's a hell of a lot. And I'm also working on Erica Kennedy's book, which is extremely hard to get. So we might be doing more book clubs. Um, let's see. Messenger from the Spiritual Army. I must see you on television and YouTube 
Sav Woa, fair, you need to be everywhere. Oh, thank you. Your show is great. I try. I definitely try, and I appreciate the support. And also, thank you for joining a membership, the membership messenger for the spiritual army of angels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. The libraries do not have them. The libraries do not have them, y'all. And you can't even buy them anymore. The, the book was done in 2004. If you don't know who Erica Kennedy is, Erica Kennedy was Kim Porter and Kimora Lee's best friend. She's Kimora Lee's children's godmother. She was the maid of honor at the, at the wedding. I was about to say the funeral. She was a maid of honor at the wedding. And her, her passing is shrouded in mystery. So I'm trying to get the book, but she's definitely on the list. More will be explained when I do the death toll video. So have a good day, guys. Uh, I'm going to see you all later.